Have you ever wondered how games add these giant flowing fields of grass, animating with the wind and reacting to player movement? Or giant lifelike schools of fish? Or even massive crowds of people? All this without a hitch in performance? While computers are fast, if you think about it, that's a lot of stuff to update at once. Sometimes several thousands or millions of instances are drawn in games at once. It's almost magic how it just works. What's this sorcery all about? Now, I'm not going to pretend like I know exactly how all these systems are implemented. Some of it probably is sorcery, but the key here is they're rendered and updated massively in parallel using the power of the GPU. What's that? I didn't work on those games? How do I know that? Well, once you reach a certain scale, scenes like these pretty much have to be implemented using the GPU. Try to implement anything to that scale entirely on the CPU in real time, even with faster languages like C, and you'll hit a performance ceiling rather quickly. Heck, probably even with multi-threading. If you asked me to make a scene with a field of grass swaying in the wind when I was first learning programming and Godot, I'd probably try making thousands of blade of grass nodes controlled by a GD script spawning them in randomly. I then run the scene and then step back and watch as my PC catches fire. It's getting too big. I can't find my fire extinguisher. I run out of the house in a hurry, realizing my beloved cat is still inside, but the fireman won't let me back inside. And now my cat's been burnt to a crisp because I didn't have the forethought to use my graphics card. Anyways, I mostly work with 2D games, so GPU optimizations can seem kind of overkill. But the same GPU optimizations can and do make sense in some 2D games. It's not too hard to find some 2D games rendering thousands of things at once. Now Godot isn't well known for its performance, but that doesn't mean you can't implement a scene that approaches the complexity of some of these GPU optimized scenes. One of the tools Godot offers to offload some of the work to your GPU is the Multi-Mesh Instance 2D node. In this video, I want to share what I learned about the Multi-Mesh Instance 2D nodes at Godot. I'm by no means an expert on this, but I know enough to be dangerous. I'll do my best to break it down for y'all today. Let's dive in. Just about every 2D game is made up of a lot of textures which you want to move around with code. And many games have several very similar game objects in a scene with similar sprites and animations that don't quite fit using a particle system. GPU particles are great for drawing lots of stuff, but have a limited lifespan. For more long-lived textures, you'll want to use something else. So, depending on the game and how many repetitive renders you have among your scenes, switching to multi-mesh instance can drastically improve how your game runs. I didn't realize this was something you might need to optimize for until I checked the visual profiler when my performance was tanking in my game, only to realize I was making 13,000 draw calls per frame a task that took my GPU several milliseconds to finish. I was like, hmm, that seems like a lot. So after investigating solutions, discovering Multi-Mesh Instance 2D and implementing it, I got it down to a couple thousand draw calls, gaining back several FPS as well. So from my personal experience, I can say there's definitely an advantage in using Multi-Mesh Instance 2D in some cases. Let's walk through a quick example in a little more detail. Say you want to build a scene where there are 2,000 goblins. If you create a goblin scene with a sprite 2D node, you're telling Godot to draw them in 2,000 separate draw calls. Hey, you keep mentioning draw calls, what's a draw call? In short, a draw call is a request from the CPU to the GPU to draw something. Okay, but why do we want to reduce it? Now the CPU to GPU communication takes some time, so if you have several draw calls, all asking the GPU to render something small and simple, a bottleneck is created. The GPU will constantly be waiting on the CPU for the next order, because each order is so easy and quick to complete. If you batch your game's rendering into fewer, larger orders, this bottleneck will be reduced. Less frame time will be spent waiting on this communication, the GPU and CPU will be running more simultaneously, the impatient GPU is happy, he gets a proper challenge to keep him busy, and your game will get more FPS. So we have all these redundant draw calls, one for each goblin. Now we might not run into any issues leaving it at that, but now what if you want to add a shadow for each goblin and give some of them hats? Draw the goblin, shadow, and hat sprite separately and you're now up to 6,000 draw calls. You could merge possible art combinations into a single sprite and get back down to 2,000 draw calls, 
but that can become tricky to manage. Oh wait, hang on, I just got a call from my game designer. Yes? Mm-hmm. Okay. We now need to support up to 10,000 goblins at once, each capable of wearing several types of hats with dynamically sized shadows and multiple state animations. Okay, sure, we can implement this. Now if you want to keep the draw calls down, you need to create the artwork and animations for all possible combinations and condense it down to one sprite per goblin. Now wait until the hats get redesigned and you have to go back and edit all the art. You're also limited on animating the art when you merge different variations. You might want the hat to bounce up and down while the goblin hops back and forth. Something much easier to implement when the sprites are drawn separate. My point is, we found ourselves in a pickle. This setup isn't very easy to work with. It's not performance, it's not scalable. So it needs a refactor. But before we try to optimize, let's look at why we're in a pickle. Now the scene is going to run suboptimally for a few different reasons. You are adding a new sprite node for each different thing you want to draw. This isn't scalable, and for more reasons than the high draw call count. You might think, but they're not doing much. They don't have any scripts attached to them. But even empty nodes will bog down your project. The more crowded your game's scene tree is, the slower it will run. Don't believe me? Sounds crazy? Check this out. The only code that runs here is at startup and it adds 1 million node 2Ds to the scene tree. Those node 2Ds are literally sitting in the tree doing nothing, but Godot still needs to manage them in the scene tree or something like that, which in the end is costing us performance needlessly. We're down to 18 frames per second on my i9-14900K with a project that does nothing. 1 million is a lot, and probably no one will have anywhere near that many nodes in their game at once. But I still think this test shows that node count. Even nodes doing little to nothing have a hidden cost to performance. The second reason is that each goblin has its own animation player node, even though they're all running essentially the same animation. Now, you could try to have them all share the same animation player, but I'm not sure that this is really possible in a convenient way. Let me know in the comments if you've had any success getting this running though, because it might actually be a valid option for some projects. You could also try tweens to animate them, but you may run into similar performance issues here. Now before we fix all this, I want to talk about something a little different. Figuring out the best tools and setup for the unique requirements of your game can take a good amount of troubleshooting, which can be arduous and time consuming. It helps to have a strong base of problem solving skills which can quickly be built up and strengthened by using Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant is unique in that it helps you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not in your typical memorize and regurgitate learning strategies. Each lesson not only builds knowledge on specific topics, but also helps you become a better thinker. Brilliant is fantastic at helping you build a daily learning habit, a powerful routine that compounds throughout your life. Whether you're trying to grow personally or professionally, Brilliant helps you reach that goal with just minutes a day. If you're like me and wanting to improve as a game developer by strengthening your math skills, now's the perfect time to try Brilliant. Brilliant has a vast selection of math courses and lessons, including algebra, geometry, and also vectors, a recent addition to their expanding library. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash deepdivedev, link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Alright, now back to the video. So first we're going to delete all our sprites and animation players on our goblin node. We hop over here to the main scene tree, where we'll make our first multi-mesh instance 2D, then we add our goblin texture to it. We've got to add a multi-mesh resource to this. And you have to tell it what shape each instance is using a mesh. Here I'm using a quad mesh because they're just basic rectangular textures. So we set the size of the mesh here. And you'll notice that Y is negative. If we don't have it negative, it'll actually draw upside down. That's because positive Y points down in Godot. We also have to set the instance count and the visible instance count. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Okay, now that that's all set up, all we need to do is tell our multi-mesh node where all the instances are at. 
Let's start by updating our goblin script to tell the multi-mesh where to draw the goblin using set instance transform 2D. Okay, cool. We can see the goblins are drawn like before. Now let's do the same thing with the hats and shadows. Okay, now it's looking closer to where we had it before and already we can see a massive performance increase. It's a little different having to track the IDs of instances, how many are visible, which ones are available, etc. So I actually spent some time writing this quick multi-mesh manager class. It handles all the logic for registering and removing instances, as well as tracking usable IDs that it can recycle. It also follows the camera and updates the axis aligned bounding box to fit the screen and prevent costly runtime recalculations. So, as you might have noticed, the whole way these meshes move is pretty much entirely separated from the scene tree. All the multi-mesh needs is a transform so it knows where and how to draw the instance. We actually don't really need these goblin nodes anymore if we don't want them. Okay, so I just went crazy and I set it up so that a single node manages the game logic for all instances. You can rest in peace knowing what 100,000 goblins looks like now. Yep, that's right, I got 100,000 rendering and 3 draw calls at a decent FPS with this approach using my GTX 970. Man, it's weird to think my graphics card is 10 years old now. Drawing stuff in one draw call is great because it's, it's just so fast. But if you have a game that needs Y sorting, getting them to draw in the correct order is actually a bit trickier than the ordinary sprite system you see in Godot. For that, we can take advantage of the fact that the instances are drawn in ID order. So you could assign their multi-mesh index based off of their Y position. So knowing that, we would have the instances higher on the screen assigned to the smaller indices. Now if we are overcome with the sudden urge to color these goblins differently, we have this box here, Use Colors. It lets us pass a color to a specific instance using the method, Set Instance Color. We can also check the Use Custom Data and use the Set Instance Custom Data method where we can pass another color that acts less as a color and more as additional data specific to that instance. This is important in any case where instances need to behave differently. So now we know how to move around our instances, but we've lost our animations. How do we add them back? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like the convenient animation players we had will work hand in hand with the multi-mesh instance 2D, at least to my knowledge. I mean, you could animate a node 2D and then forward its transform to the multi-mesh, but that's not super scalable when you want several hundred or thousand animations going simultaneously. The solution I found was vertex shader animations. If you have any kind of animations involving the transform of an object, that is, the rotation, position, scale, and skew, you can convert it to a vertex animation with the use of vertex shaders. And the good news is multi-mesh instances work hand in hand with these shaders. Just add the shader material to the multi-mesh instance 2D and fill the vertex function with the animation code. Being a shader, it's not as simple as writing rotation plus equals pi or something like that to animate it. I wrote this fairly modular vertex shader that lets you animate the rotation, position, skew, and scale based on a curve texture you pass to it. There's a lot of parameters to play around with to get it working pretty much identically to any transform animation done with an animation player. The cool thing about this setup is you can save the shader settings as a material resource to reuse the animation anywhere. Thanks to custom data, we can set the animation time scale to properly speed up, slow down, or pause our animation. Here you can see I'm passing this data to the instance using the red channel on the custom data color. Lots more you can do with this custom data with a little creativity. You also have an instance ID at your disposal to factor into your shader animations. So we got our instances animating nicely, but before moving on, I want to be fair and first acknowledge a few caveats with this setup. First thing is it's not as user friendly as using an animation player. Someday I might take the time to build a tool to convert animation players to a material that animates identically if all the tracks are animatable via vertex shaders. But that's a whole nother project. The second thing is the animation doesn't actually move the node. What I mean by that is the vertices are all stored on the GPU only and the Godot nodes aren't going to know about them like they would if you animated with an animation player. So say you had a physics body at the same position as your mess instance, but the vertex animation has it jump across the screen, 
the physics body isn't going to follow suit, and I don't think it's possible to retrieve the transform back from the vertex shader. I try to make the animations not move too far from the origin, so they don't desync from the node or physics body's true position. If this sounds like a little extra work, you're not wrong, but man, I was so happy with how well this one worked in the end. It takes a bit of tweaking the parameters, but it's not too hard to replicate the movements done by an animation player, just without the extra overhead. To be honest, having to replace all my animations with a shader was kind of daunting at first, but GPU animations are just so fast, it was so worth it. I'm probably going to replace a good chunk of my animation players with this. But what's up with this hopping nonsense, we want sprite sheet animations. Well the good news is you can use a simple fragment shader to switch between frames of a sprite sheet. This should get it looking like we had it before. I've already gone ahead and wrote a simple shader for just that. I've added it to the same material that has a vertex shader animations. This shader is simpler than the last, but in short, it's snapping the current frame to a cell and a sprite sheet by scaling down the UV to fit that region. All you have to do is set the multi meshes texture as your sprite sheet and set the row and column count in the material and it just works. Pretty cool, huh? You could expand the shader to allow passing a curve texture to set the easing if you want to try other interpolation types besides linear. You could also support multiple animation states utilizing the custom data for each instance. There's lots of potential with this one. There are some caveats with this fragment shader as well. Similarly to the vertex shader, our animation setup is not as full featured as animation players or trees. So at last we have everything we need to make our game work as designed, running at a reasonable frame rate. It's pretty incredible what you can do with these multi meshes. Now there's a lot more you can do with these that I didn't cover in this video. For example, like you could use pretty much any mesh with this. There's also the multi mesh instance 3D node that you can check out that I assume works pretty similarly to the 2D one. But yeah, that was a little dive into the multi meshes and Godot. That's all I got for now. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.